My name is Ohad Kama. I want to thank you for the invitation to speak about the MFPS special session on Publicistic Programming Languages. Publicistic Programming Languages have become a hot topic in the area and we've in the last few years seen quite a lot of languages in this area that are called Publicistic Programming Languages and what's nice about this area is that the uh, Practitioners seem to be listening carefully to semanticists and vice versa. So there's a very nice interplay between the semantics and the language design. And for me, that's very exciting. And matching this proliferation of languages out there, we're seeing a proliferation in semantics out there in the major community, sub communities in our area. So MFPS, especially, who have been doing it for many years, but also Lix and Popol and the more applied conferences like NeurIPS and PLDI. And Several years ago, Prakash has asked me to try and build bridges between very different semantics to probabilistic programming languages. So that's very hard. So I thought of doing something maybe slightly easier, which is trying to find ways to build bridges and connections between languages. Okay, so there's so many languages out there. Yeah, what I'm going to do today is propose a way of organizing those languages. Okay, and it's based around these two axi. Okay, probabilistic programming language. Yeah, would have some constructs for sampling and some constructs for conditioning. Okay, and I've identified these two axi uh, to go about, and this talk is about fleshing these out. Now, I'm not saying that every programming, probabilistic programming language fits nicely into this square, some would fit outside of this square, but if you're in this square, we can try to build more bridges between them, and if you're not, then uh, we know it's something quite different. Okay, so the two, um, the two axi, okay, so the first one, Conditioning is about being graded or non-graded, um, which I'm going to explain in the rest of, this, of the talk. And the second axi is uh, whether you're conditioning based on a density or based on a distribution. Okay, and this is uh, part of ongoing work. So I'm going to spend most of the talk in this square trying to uh, explain what is a graded density-based language and semantics uh, for probabilistic programming. Um, and then I'm going to go down this axi spend some time explaining what does the non-graded language looks like and what kind of the what does the semantics look like and then spend very little time here i don't have a good answer for the full ge fully general non-graded distribution based uh, language but i'm going to outline some thoughts i've been having in this square and hopefully this could start further discussion about building bridges between different languages and different semantics okay so first i'm going to talk generally about probabilistic programming languages in this uh, context, and then start uh, left to right, top to bottom. Okay, so very basically, we're in the game of building uh, statistical distributions. So what does that usually look like? We have some data set. In this case, we have three pairs of X, Y inputs. Okay, and we're trying to explain statistically some process that generated uh, those data points. So in this case, I'm looking at a very simple Bayesian linear regression, okay, even homogeneous linear regression, where we say, okay, okay, there's some kind of linear process, y equals ax, we don't know what a is, there's some distribution over this a, and our goal is to find this distribution. Okay, and what we're doing is writing a little generative model, okay, for, for generating this data. So we say a is a priori, or priori uh, distributed normally around zero, uh, with standard deviation two, okay, so if you look at the density function for that, that looks like this very wide distribution around zero. And um, then we have those three data points and we're uh, sampling um, x equals one, x equals two, x equals three, okay, then y should be a times one, a times two, a times three, and we're adding some noise of this measurement, which so there's some standard deviation of a quarter. Okay, and then we have those three data points. That's what the, mo that's what the model look like, looks like. Okay, and what you know, the Bayesian posterior distribution that it represents, well, we can uh, describe its density function. Okay, the probability that A is between a lower bound and an upper bound, sample from this posterior distribution, is proportional to this integral. So you integrate according to the first sample, and then you multiply by those three different densities. Okay, or normally distributed with the appropriate numbers. If you plug this in, this is what you get. And then when you normalize this integral, you get this density. Okay, it's just slightly below one. Okay, so that's very basic intro to probabilistic 
programming. We want to write these models. We want to write them in the programming language. Okay, so this this way we can make machines understand them, machine un analyze them, uh, run them, and also scale them up to many more data points. Okay, so abstracting away from this example in a probabilistic programming language, at least in the context that I'm talking about, okay, we have two core constructs, one for sampling and one for one conditioning. Okay, so in the, in the previous example, we sampled an A out of a normal distribution, so we can sample some X out of a distribution, we bind it in some in the rest of the program. And the other construct is saying we have some value, okay, and some other distribution, and we're saying when we're sampling, uh, we're going to patch up the distribution, we're going to update our distribution based on this value. Okay, and, and because previously uh, we used the same notation, so the statisticians might be using this same notation for both of these constructs, I'm adopting a notation by Ramzi and Shan, where we're adding a little arrow um, on the sampling uh, symbol telling us whether we're sampling, so this means from this distribution I'm sticking a value into x, I'm binding a value into x, or going the other way around, I'm using this value to update my distribution. So these are the two core constructs we're going to have in our probabilistic programming language. And then we have other constructs, the most important one for this talk would be a sequencing construct, because probabilistic programming, these two probabilistic constructs are effectful constructs, so we sequence them like you would do in any other functional language. And of course you can add lots of other features, high order functions, algebraic data types, state and other effects. I'm not going to talk about that in this talk, I just want to focus on the probability theory. First order, so it's a very simple semantic setting, okay, and of course it would be lots of extension in all kinds of other directions, and it's a very fruitful area for research. Okay, so if we try to concretely kind of build up this language, we'll sketch out a concrete language uh, to work with, and then we'll explain how it may change as we go through that taxonomy that I'm proposing. Okay, so for all of the languages we're going to consider, we're going to have some base types. Okay, this would be a finite discrete type, so we have a finite set of labels, or a countable natural numbers, or some continuous intervals from you know, 1 to 2, or, or uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, um, and we allow ourselves tuples of them. Okay, so very, very uh, simple collection of types, some continuous, some discrete. I think it's important to include the continuous ones because uh, it forces you to really work out some measure theoretic foundations to what's happening. But uh, definitely some probabilistic programming languages will not have the continuous uh, types. But for this, so this talk will include both uh, discrete and continuous. Okay, and we're going to have a deterministic variable context. Okay, so just uh, tuples of those base types. Okay, so this is going to be the same in all the uh, rubrics I'm going to consider in this talk. Okay, so we're starting on the top left corner. Okay, we're going to start with graded sampling and density-based conditioning. Okay, so in order to set this up, okay, we have a, a syntactic class of stock measures. Okay, so what, what will those be? And those stock measures are stock measures we're going to use to integrate over the types that I've shown you in the previous slide. <coughs> so uh, the simplest one is a categorical distribution over a, a finite uh, type. Okay, L1 to Ln, uh, statisticians call it categorical distributions, and the stock measure here would be, as we'll see in a few slides, um, would be uh, the counting measure. So we're just counting how many L1s we have, how many L Ln we have. Similarly, when we go to the natural numbers, we're going to be just adding uh, the, counting num the counting measure over the natural numbers. Okay, so when you give me a subset of the natural numbers, it's going to assign how many elements are in it, including infinity. Uh, we have a Lebesgue measure over uh, closed interval AD and the Lebesgue measure over the whole free line. Okay, so these are the uh, four stock measures we'll be using. In particular applications, we might be choosing uh, different stock measures depending on uh, slightly different sampling constructs. But just to demonstrate what's happening, I'm just going to take these four measures. And using those stock measures, we're going to create sample spaces, just like context of uh, n tuples of them. Okay, and now once we have a stock measure, we can talk about uh, probability distributions that have density with respect to that stock measure. Okay, so uh, I'm, I've ma I'm matching them against uh, the stock measures. So the first one is um, <clears throat> we have some categorical distribution, m1 to mn are going to be uh, relative weights for each of those points, and that's with respect to uh, the counting measure on the finite set. We're going to have the geometric distribution over the natural numbers, and this is going to be the uh, probability of success in the, in the experiment. 
we have the uniform distribution of a uh, closed interval a to b so this has to be a f you know, a, a and b have to be um, finite and we have uh, a normal distribution over the whole grid line so we have to supply its mean and standard deviation okay so we have a little syntax for stop measures and then once we know what the stop measure is we can talk about measures that have density with respect to that stop measure okay so now let's start, start describing, describing the type system, system. Um, we're, we're going to have two, two kinds of judgments. The, the first one says M in context, context gamma, assuming uh, a sample space omega has type A. And an example would be, for example, if I have M and N and I want to sequence them, let X equals M in N. Well, if M has sample space omega 1 and N has sample space omega 2, I'm going to be concatenating the two sample spaces together. So it's a graded type system. It's a very standard concept in uh, programming language theory. And, and this is this top, this is what the, the gradedness means. This means we're syntactically keeping in track of the shape of the samples we've done. And um, in languages like STAN, uh, you do have to very carefully explain um, what shape of the sample space uh, you are using in your program. It has a very rigid structure. So that's one kind of judgment, uh, term judgments. The other one is distribution judgment, where we say uh, which stock measure this uh, the distribution term mu uh, has density. Okay, so for example, if I have some term uh, calculating the mean, so it's a real number, uh, in some sample space omega 1, another term calculating the standard deviation in some sample space uh, 0 to infinity, Okay, then I can form the uh, normal distribution with mean, mean, and standard deviation, SDV, and that has density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, as a stock measure. Okay, so this is the second kind of judgment that I'll be making. Okay, and now the two core um, judgments we'll be uh, focusing on are uh, judgment for sampling and a judgment for uh, conditioning. Okay, so if I want to sample uh, from a distribution mu in some n, well then mu must have some density with respect to uh, stock measure p, and n, uh, once I've bound x deterministically, um, it's going to have some type a, and now I'm going to put together these three uh, sam uh, sample spaces together, st making sure p is in the middle. Okay, and of course you can think of endless extensions of how to manipulate this um, sample space syntax substructurally or structurally, in order to you know shuffle things around, think about conditionals, think about traces, and so on. Um, there's an infinite kind of rabbit hole you can go down to, to down in, and I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Uh, so we're just going to take them very structurally. Okay, so that's sampling. Um, conditioning uh, is a bit simpler from the type system. Uh, we have two terms, m and mu, that has density respect to p, and we're conditioning uh, um, we're conditioning mu on m. And just the only uh, wiggle here is that mu needs to have density with respect to p, and p has some underlying space uh, it's distributing over, and m has to have that type p. So if p was Lebesgue, this will be the whole real line. If p was a bounded Lebesgue, this will be the interval it's, it's over. If p was the counting measure, the infinite counting measure, this will be the natural numbers, and so forth and so on. And conditioning just have the unit type. So it's just a, a single finite type with just a single constructor called star. Okay. So, so far that's the language. Okay. So this is the language where we have density based conditioning and graded sampling. So, so what would the semantics look like? like? So, so every, every space, space type A denotes a standard world space. A standard world space roughly is uh, natural numbers or continuous real uh, space. So very well behaved measurable spaces. <coughs> Uh, a stock measure space P will denote um, a standard Borel space and a signifying distribution. It's going to be specifically the counting measure of the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so there's some uh, there's going to be some semantic question mark exactly what this property should be, but in this very specific case, I'm going to be taking what we, we're intending, which is just the counting measure of the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so for example, uh, the measure that the categorical distribution of L1 to Ln uh, denotes is the measure that uh, just counts the number of labels, each, of, each one of them. Okay, the Lebesgue measure means integrating respect to the Lebesgue, Lebesgue measure and so forth. Okay, and when we have a sample space omega, it's just going to be a product, right, of, um, of each stock measure, taking the product measure uh, between them. 
Okay, so that's uh, straightforward and standard. Okay, to interpret terms, uh, a term is going to be interpreted as two component functions. So one of them is a valuation. Okay, so given uh, given some a choice of the so gi given an element of the environment and then some choice of the uh, probabilistic choices in our sample space, then we're going to evaluate or value a. Okay, value in the space denoted by a. And we also have a density term that tells us what is the density of each of those values for every uh, choice of uh, values for the um, sample space, we're going to give back a weight, so a number between 0 and infinity, including 0 and infinity. Okay, and of course you can think of all kinds of other semantic invariants you might want to enforce on these functions, for example, that you know, you're going to be uh, invariant under, um, under uh, chain, you know, changing of the, of the space regarding to independent uh, tossings and so on. Okay, so, and, and that relates to some work that uh, Radu Mata and uh, Dexter and Prakash and Tema Scott and others um, have worked on. Um, so, so potential bridge here, but I'm, I'm not going to go down finding those exact environments. So far, we're gonna, this, is, this, is, this semantics is very, very intentional in that, in that sense. And similarly, we define distributions uh, to be densities. Okay, so um, mu is a distribution with density with respect to p if uh, for every choice of uh, p element and choice of the parameters, because it's parameterized by some um, sample space omega, I give uh, some kind of weight. Okay, so the meaning of mu is just uh, density of this distribution with respect to the stock measure over p. Okay, so for example, if I want to look at the uh, semantics of sampling, okay, well, what is the density of something mu? Well, uh, if you give me the choices, so W1 is the choices for defining mu, A is the value over which mu, over this, the space mu distributes over, and W2 is the choices that are going to be done in N. Well, the, the density for that is the density um, of uh, getting that the measure mu, and the semantics for conditioning. Um, uh, once I know what m is and what and what mu is, then I'm just going to be multiplying uh, the density of getting m out by the density at the point m. Okay, so that's um, very natural, and, and that would give us um, the semantics we had in the starting slide of where we multiply, uh, we integrate according to Lebesgue measure, and then multiply um, the three um, densities. Okay, and the rest of the semantics is very standard once we realize that what we have here is a graded monad. Okay, so I'm not uh, going to go into too much depth here, but we have a kind of a graded reader-writer monad. So once you give me, um, once you give me this little hyper here, once you give me uh, the elements of the sample space, I'm going to give you back uh, a weight, and the, a the weights add up multiplicatively according to the monoid structure we have on zero to infinity. Okay, and so once you know that, you can think of how the rest of the semantics will fan out, and if you start adding more features, assume that it behave nicely with respect to something in conditioning, um, they will, their semantics will be given in, in the usual kind of graded monad uh, structure. Okay, so so far this is the uh, this is the semantics of the language. I just want to add two more uh, points about about the progressive programming semantics. So first, um, the semantics we're given is quite intentional. Okay, one, you can think about what will be more extensional semantics. Well, every model, okay, which is just a term M in context gamma with sample space omega of type A, gives us a kernel that goes from uh, gamma to A, okay, which I call M dist. Okay, and what is that kernel? Well, given any choice of the deterministic variables in gamma, and any measurable set U, any measurable subset of U of A, um, the probability of a landing in that set is the integral of you know, integrate over the sample space, take the density of that point, and then uh, either integrate or don't integrate, depending on whether you land in that set U. So you can put this U on an integral or just integrate a characteristic function. Okay, so every model describes a kernel, and every kernel has a model evidence function, which just means what is the total measure at each point. Okay, so the evidence, the model evidence M, once I've chosen the deterministic variables gamma, or the parameters gamma, is the total measure of the whole space under that kernel. And 
I don't have a very good semantic understanding of this beyond what I just said. It's just that statisticians seem to really care about the model evidence and they use it to somehow debug their models. If it's very, very close to zero, they think it's a very bad fit. And if it's very, very close to infinity, okay, then they're also worried about it and they tell you, oh, the model might diverge and so on. And, and when you use languages like Stan, they, they really tell you what's happening to this model evidence and, and you can use that to, to, to check whether your, your model is robust to the very different data sets and so on. Okay, so, so um, as far as I can tell, there's some semantic story to tell, right? to tell and, and the semantics should account for model evidence. So if your semantics always normalizes to one, there's something missing, something that people in practice seems to care about that you're not modeling. Okay, so this is a very quick description of the top left corner, the kind of very simple corner of uh, graded uh, sampling, density, conditioning, and uh, a lot of what statisticians uh, think about or, or probabilistic programming programmers in the very big languages like Pyro and Stan, they really think in those terms. So they think about a very explicit description of the sample space, you have very fine control over it, and you conditioning always respect to densities. Okay, so that's the, the, sp the space that we more or less know what's happening, and, and knowing this description already means you can do quite a lot of good work there from a semantics perspective, just because the semantics is so straightforward. Okay. So, what I glossed over in this description so far is some foundational issues. I'm not going to spend a lot of slides over those. Um, this is just one take on how you might overcome those uh, semantic foundations. Uh, but I do want to say a couple of words on it. So in the course of describing the semantics, uh, we talked about W to the omega, so the space of functions from omega to W, okay, uh, which is in general is not going to be a measurable space. Right? So um, the space of weights, zero to infinity, if you exponentiate variable numbers, there's just no, no nice structure there, and that's called Naumann's theorem. And many people also in this session have talked about that. I don't want to go to too much details, but the way I get around it is by using um, a mathematical structure we've been developing over the last few years called quasi borel spaces. Uh, we, we, the first paper appeared in 2017 at Lakes uh, with Chris Hoyland, Samstead, and uh, Hong Suk Yang. And just briefly, just to give you a flavor of what a quasi world space is, it's a pair of two things. First, a set, okay, so it's a space of points, together with a collection of subsets of functions from the real line onto the space X. Okay, that's closed under some axioms. We call those uh, this, these functions random elements, okay, because they correspond to random elements from probability and statistics. And the axiom says things like um, every constant function is a random element. Okay, or pre-composing a random element with a measurable function gives you a random element. Okay, and the point is that every measurable space has a quasi borel space structure by taking the random elements to be all the measurable functions from the reals into that space. Okay, so somehow measurable spaces fit into this universe. Okay, and this universe, I mean, it's a category. Okay, so I can define morphism between quasi borel spaces or morphism from space x to space y is a function from the points of x to the points of y, uh, such that when I post-compose this function with a random element in x, I get a random element in y. So it's also an algebraic closure condition. Okay, and the point about this category at UBS is that if I look at standard Borel spaces, either as standard Borel spaces, so as measurable spaces, or quasi Borel spaces, the morphism between them behave the same. So we have a conservative extension of the universe of measurable spaces. Okay on the well-behaved spaces, on standard world spaces. And of course, the benefit is that quasi world spaces is a very well-behaved semantic universe, whereas measurable spaces is not so well-behaved. Specifically, we have functions, uh, we have quotients, we have um, subspaces, and so on. Okay, and so so what I do here is, I, the development I do uh, in I've done, done so, so far, far you know, I've, I've been looking, looking at um, function spaces, spaces, I've been defining things with lambda. lambda, I did all, all of this internally to quasi world spaces, spaces, and of course, once I Kind of instantiate everything to the first order, order fragment of standard Borel spaces. I haven't, uh, I haven't changed anything. It was as if I was working with standard Borel spaces all along, and uh, it's very liberating. I don't have to check measurability conditions at all. Everything just works out fine. So even though I'm not actually doing higher order semantics, I'm just defining my semantics in a meta theory that's higher order. It's very pleasant. So I very strongly recommend to people to try to do that. I mean, quasi-world space is how I do it because I'm familiar with it. If you have a better semantic framework to do it, try that. 
and see how it works for you. Okay, so this was uh, first note on foundations. And in order to talk about distributions, we have a monad of uh, quasi world spaces called the distribution monad. And you can read about it in this paper from 2018 in Popol. And for standard world spaces, what it does is it assigns to a standard world space S. The, the set of points is the S finite measures on S. Okay, and this, the random elements are S finite kernels from the reals into S. So what's an S finite kernel? Because an S finite measure is just an S finite kernel from the uh, singleton space. So an S finite kernel is a sigma affine combination of probability kernels. Okay, so K is S finite if there is a countable collection of probability kernels Kn and some countable collection of weights between zero and infinity. And I can create this sigma affine combination and that gives me an S finite kernel. And the collection of such kernels <coughs> um, is all the S finite kernels. Okay, so it's a, it's suitable for doing uh, probabilistic programming semantics, and some uh, Staten in 2017 proved that you can define all of them in a very minimal first order probabilistic programming language. So somehow it's a very nice environment to maintain semantically, and that's the that's the model I work with. Um, I should say this is a model over quasi world spaces. We currently don't know if there's a model over standard world spaces uh, that give you the S finite kernels. So this just works for, uh, this is specifically to quasi world spaces, but again, I'm only talking about first order programs, so I'm quite happy to be in that, uh, with that restriction. Okay, so let's now move, for, so previously I told you about the top left corner, right, when uh, sampling is graded and conditioning is based on density, we're going to go down this axis, right, the axis of sampling becoming non-graded. Okay, so what does that look like? Programming with this explicit description of the sample space omega is tedious. Okay, in the same way that kind of telling manually annotating your your resources in the program is tedious. You want somehow we want it to happen another scene. Okay, so we prefer instead to just say not have the omega on our judgments, to just say M has some variables like X's, but I don't really keep track of the shape of the sample space. Similarly for my distributions. Okay, so semantically. Okay, instead of working with density for uh, uh, for everything, uh, I work we work with s finite kernels. Okay, every term is an s finite kernel from the variables into um, the return type. But measures, okay, so this is uh, still on this axis. Our distributions are still densities. Okay, so we still think of distributions when we're conditioning as densities. Okay, so now we can include as primitives in our language arbitrary probability distributions for sampling. sampling. Okay, so, so you can, can add whatever distribution you want to add as sampling, uh, you can add it, and of course you, you can sample from arbitrary subterms. But, but when you condition, you still need to know density. Okay, so assume uh, that mu has some density with respect to some stock measure, then I can talk about conditioning mu with respect to this value m. Okay, so I only, I've only changed sampling, not conditioning. And as a consequence, my language, my modeling language has become more convenient. Okay, so there's a little trade-off. Okay. But the downside of the trade-off is that inference be becomes more difficult. Or rather, if I know the shape of the sample space, I can do very efficient inference for it. So for example, Stan employs a very efficient inference method called Hamidori Monte Carlo or any other, I mean, it's a big system, it's a bit more complicated, but automatic differentiation via rational inference algorithm. Yeah, this is a specific algorithm that they use inside STAN. Um, and it really much depends on having this expli explicit description of the sample space, right? Once you know that up front, then you can do very efficient inference. Okay, so what can we do? And, and again, I'm not uh, advocating each of them, I'm just outlining uh, the current approaches out there. So one thing we can do is pay the price, right? So if you want a richer modern language, then we you know, sacrifice the inference a bit and go further towards uh, um, the, no, the, the non-graded sampling. Or the other way around, you know, really care about inference. We have a lot of data. We want very good, accurate answers. So we say, okay, like what we do in, in, in program optimizations, we would change the program, we change the model a bit uh, to make sure that it's clear to the uh, runtime system or the, comp the compiler how to do efficient inference on it. Okay, so we'll be rewriting our models in terms of a parameterized uh, setting, uh, so we'll get this extra benefit in inference. Okay, and um, so that's uh, one thing one can do, and that's one thing people do. Okay, so Stan is highly used 
uh, has easily thousands of users. And the other thing we might do is use some static analysis to somehow compile a program from a non-graded program into a graded program. Okay, so for example, very nice work by um, Grainova, Gordon and Sutton from uh, last year is Slick Stan, where you write a, a model in a language that's non-graded, and then they do some static analysis on it, some information for analysis to generate a, a graded program out of it okay, and feed that into Stan. Another piece of recent nice work is by uh, Levelau, uh, where they use Haskell's a very expressive type system extended with raw types to keep track of the uh, the sample space in the type that you write with. So uh, it feels like you're writing in a, in a non-graded setting, but under the hood, the compiler tries to work out what the grading is, and if it can't work that out, uh, it complains. Okay, so so it's a bit like programming in a non-graded world, but in, in, it's programming in a graded world, but feeling like you're in the non-graded world most of the time. Okay, it's a very impressive piece of recent work. Okay, so that was going down this axis, and very briefly I'm going to talk about going down up the turning densities into distributions axis for conditioning. This is still ongoing work, so this is still a bit loose, so I'm just going to have one slide on it. Okay, so <coughs> the, the idea, idea here again, we're putting, putting back the gradient, so we always know what sample space we're in, we're in but we're, we're allowing arbitrary distributions, distributions um, uh, to, to condition with respect to. Okay, the restriction, restriction is they have to have density with respect to P. So um, there is a density, I don't know what it is, and I'm allowing arbitrary terms there. So previously we knew exactly what was the term, we knew it would be either Gaussian or, or uniform or categorical and so on. Now we're saying, no, no, it has to be, um, it can be any, any term. Okay, and so how does the semantics change? Well, we're looking at, uh, we're keeping track of the distribution over the sample space. Okay, so we have some distribution that has density with respect to the sample space, um, and we have some random variable. Okay, that's going to be the semantics. So we have two components. I call this the latent semantics. Okay, so it's a distribution over the latent variables, partition is called it, so just about the sample space, and then some valuation. Okay, so that's very much like before, only I'm um, looking at this distribution rather than keeping track of uh, the density. And now when I order condition, I have to do a little wiggle, and that has to do with this integration. So roughly what happens there is uh, I have my sample space, I have some val valuation from it into uh, the space P that uh, my distribution is over. I'm just integrating in respect to the stock measure here, which again will sigma finite. Okay, and then I have some distribution over P and I'm kind of pushing it and looking for whatever density I have. So you have to use um, Lebesgue's decomposition theory to make that work. Okay. So that's roughly what happens, but I don't want to go into too much detail because it's still ongoing work. So I wouldn't um, stand too much behind this until I, you know, calculate a few more examples and be sure about it and calculate the relationships it gives you in this square. Okay. So, but what, what I'm hoping is that it will allow us to build bridges. Okay, well, this is the point uh, with uh, work by Ramzi Shan and Hakaru and uh, Narada Yanan um, and others. Uh, from very recently, where they use this integration in order to, to give semantics to, to probabilistic programs and, and really try to present that work in this kind of setting of um, uh, distribution-based uh, conditioning. Um, there's some un good unpublished work by uh, Ong Mathieson who's taking forward this idea of this integration and they have to give sophisticated algorithms for calculating this integration because at the end of the day you have a program you want to disintegrate it. It would be very hard to do that. So you have to come up with algorithms for that. And this formulation is very, very close to uh, the impressive work by Fred Alquist and collaborators on Bayesian inversion. Okay, so this is, where, well, this is where I'm taking this idea from, right? this, uh, using conditioning as some kind of Bayesian update along with this integration. Um, one thing to watch out for is that there's some you know, foundational care you have to take. Um, with disintegrating sigma finite measures, that's fine, but we need to then show that this integration as an operation is itself measurable. That can also be fine. I mean, there's a theorem by Kallenberg of a uniform disintegrator, but you have to be careful um, to make that work. And also, the Lebesgue decomposition theorem also needs to be itself measurable. So there's a few steps, uh, you know, still work in progress. So, so I'm just trying to maybe excite you about, about uh, some 
current development in this area. And I haven't talked at all about the enumerated bits of the fourth square, the bottom right square in this taxonomy, which will be super interesting to come up with and coming up with new influence algorithms. I don't really know, I'm not sure which languages fit in that square yet. So, so um, it will, maybe there's a new one to be discovered, or maybe you know some of the ones out there already fit it, and we already have some inference algorithms there. Or maybe one has to compile up the square from the bottom right corner to the top left corner uh, in order to make it work. But uh, I don't have much specifics to say uh, in this area yet. But hopefully watch this space. Okay, so summary. Okay, I outline this square again not all languages fit in this square some fit elsewhere but the point is that if we know whether, to, where we can, whether we can place a language in this square or out with it then we already have some crude ways of relating different languages and different semantics uh, and comparing them and within the square uh, I understand this axis very well this axis is still for me ongoing and really exciting and it's, it could be potentially cool maths here and when we have a good understanding uh, of both these axi, hopefully we can find uh, the fourth one. And just a side note, as I said, I use quasi world space as a foundation for, for, for this work. Not mandatory, but I recommend trying it out, because otherwise you really have to carry a lot of measurability uh, requirements on the side, and, and here I, you really have to only check them in very specific places, and it was very liberating, so I recommend to you to, to, to use that, or at least try using that kind of theory. Thank you for your time.